this is Prios and I'm a professional gambler and today I will review a video of fellow halls and yeah this video is titled I won millions with these live poker tiles so I'm very excited to learn more about this and yeah as I am not a live player I don't know much about live tiles but we probably can learn a lot from him I in generally I generally think that live tiles are overrated but there might be a few guys out there in the world that actually can pick things up from their opponents and he might be one of them at least his results are amazing so he's probably one of the best guys to learn something about and yeah the thumbnail already is very promising laser eyes I mean it's probably not a hint to Bitcoin and and cryptocurrencies but maybe it is a hidden hint and yeah speaking of cryptocurrencies and finance I also got a second channel and I would urge you to subscribe to that one as well I'm a bit tilted but I just have 29 subscribers so if you want to do me a favor and learn something about finance and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and investing feel free to subscribe for this channel as well and yeah there are also better things out there than reads because you can have a program make the reads for you and this is possible with holder manager or poker tracker and this works online and basically you don't have to pay attention anymore because you have stats for anything and this also uh, tracks your results so this is a very useful program i recommend this to everyone and it would be nice if you knew the referral links from me because when I get a little share, the price stays the same. And yeah, if you are readless, then you should stick to the plan to play GTO and to learn GTO for PLO. There are two programs out there there's the PLO Trainer, and the other one is PLO Vision. And yeah, if you want to use one of these programs the same is true we as for holder manager yeah please look into the links i got below and yeah without further ado let's now see what fellow holds has to say about life tells and i think we all probably can learn enough thanks to him and yeah let's get into the video what's up guys it's fedor and today i want to share my secrets around life tells I did a module on this in my masterclass for Poker Code, but I want to take out some of the highlights and make a really cool YouTube video on the key things I look at when I play live poker and how I exploit other players and what the main things are that I can extract from it. Now, I believe as a baseline, tells and live reads are a super overlooked and fundamental thing of live poker because especially if you get better at poker and if you're on a really high level there is so much you can draw from how people behave and also when you have played a lot of volume such an important part is having played thousands or tens of so he it sounds like he thinks that live tells are very important while i said the opposite thousands of live hands and having met thousands and tens of thousands of opponents. I don't know what the exact number is, but I probably have played against tens of thousands of different live opponents just because tables mix and I've played um, so many live poker tournaments and patterns repeat. So to start right away, there is no one solution for live tells. There's not one thing you can see and that means this thing. Yeah, I also think this might differ from player to player. So if someone gets very aggressive and mean, it might mean that he is weak, but for the different opponent, it might mean he's strong. So yeah, that's also what I think. I don't think so. I think the context is always important, but there are situations that can come together that make you lead towards one outcome really strongly to make that very likely that they have a really strong hand or a really weak hand. And this type of information, even though it's not final and not absolute, is so important to take into consideration because you will make better decisions in the long run if your interpretation is somewhat accurate. So I want to give you some insights into what I'm looking for, 
what the key aspects are that I'm looking out for and how I exploit it in the end. Now I generally make a differentiation in three different parts. One is background. I'll explain on what that means. Second is poker related tells and third is body related tells. And then I try to piece them together to come to a conclusion. I think the body related uh, things because you uh, might be very meaningful. I mean, if you have something that is uh, yeah, so I mean, what is it called? You have like yeah, it's there, then usually means that someone is at least he could be excited, but he could also be fearful that you now call his bluff. And yeah, sorry, I'm missing some English vocabulary, but yeah, maybe he's better in explaining it. I mean, probably because he is, he is here for the live tells. Experience I have made is that the more you can put pictures together, the better idea you get in the end. Because oftentimes it's actually very insightful to get. I think what could make a lot of sense if you look into what police officers and people do when they interrogating people and what they try to pick up and this might also be helpful for poker just a side note i never did that but this is probably helpful at contradicting input or additional input from different angles now let me explain and jump right into the first thing what i mean by background information a lot of information is hidden before you even start playing poker with other people. And I try to actively look out for that. I think it also makes a huge difference um, what type of player you are playing. One player probably on average give away way more things than the pros. And yeah, it's also important um, the background of what he said. I mean, if people are drunken, they might get less careful and yeah, reveal things more often, for example. WSOP main event is a fantastic example. I don't know 7,000 of the 8,000 players who are playing, or maybe a bit less, but... So he knows 1,000 players, that's a lot. I know quite some, but I don't know a lot of them. And yet I have a read on every single player. How's that possible? The only way it's possible is that there are population reads and who they are not is also a big read. If there is a 50 year old American guy who I figure out won his seat in his home game satellite, then I know he's not an online professional. That already in itself is such an important information. So I think people always overlook the information that's hidden in who they're not or who their opponents are not, rather than trying to look out exactly who they are. Knowing that he's not a top online professional already makes me exclude a lot of things that I believe he might do. So if this player is overbetting, it's unlikely that he has studied this spot and that he knows that he should have this or that he knows about a potential balanced approach and will have bluffs there. It's most likely that he just has a strong hand and wants to extract value. And I make concrete examples so that it's easier to understand why this is valuable. If he is in a spot where um, he bets and I think he doesn't really have intuitive bluffs so he would have needed to study this spot to know which type of hands to bluff then I think that he's very likely to have a really strong hand just because from knowing that I think he probably hasn't studied like an online professional has. Knowing in which category people fall is really important and now let's get to the concrete categories. So if you want to profile your opponents you need to be looking for what type of characters they are and what characteristics they have because that will translate directly to their game of poker, especially if they're less studied. I really wonder what the categories will be. Like tech, lag, fish, maniac, something like that. Let's see. So one of the key things I'm looking for is, are there more on the ego-driven aggression side who will try to fight back? So that's, it could be an attack or a maniac. Or are they more on the conservative passive side where they will reclude? These are the main categories I try to go into without getting too much specific because I believe that will show directly within their play style. 
someone who's more on the passive side will take a step back when you show a lot of aggression. They will not necessarily try to fight back. They will not try to win the pot at every cost. They will not try to pick you off if necessary. They will just go out of your way and most likely play strong hands. So when they fight back, then you can easily give up. And especially with such an aggressive play style that I have, I think it's really important to identify these different characteristics before the game starts. So I start to make conversation with people to try to figure out what character they are. Are they extremely outgoing? Are they wearing accessories? Do they wear an expensive watch? Do they feel like they need to show off? Then they're probably more in the aggressive fighting back category. They don't want to be put down. They don't want a 20 year old to uh, beat them. I, they want to show dominance and, and they will try to show that within the game. So when you look at the background information, try to put them into one of these two categories by taking a look at them. How they're dressed, how they appear, how they talk. And I think that will show pretty clearly in their play style. So there is a... I think that's so far very good advice. I like it. A lot of information already that we can take before the game has even started. Now let's get to the second point, the poker related tells. Here I want to focus on two points. One is bet sizing and two is how the chips are being stacked and put in the pot. So I believe these are two very fundamentally important things that made me a lot of money over the time because the one thing that is actually really great representation of how people play is how people stack their chips. When they put their chips really neatly together and very tightly stacked, they're most likely on the more passive side. When they have their chips more loosely and more flying around and further away from each other, especially with less experienced players, that mostly shows a, a more loose or aggressive type of style. So it's easier for them to give away the chips, whereas someone who's more keeping them closer and more stacked together is going to be a bit more tight with giving them away. I think that actually has been, it's a very simple read, but that has been something that has been valuable for me over time. But something more specific is how people bet and how they put the chips in the pot. Very, very often I've seen that you can deduct strength of the hand from the way they bet. If, for example, they choose a more loosely put together bet sizing, so also in terms of which chips they choose, that tends to be a weaker hand. If they, for example, only have 44,400 chips in their stack and they bet 4,200 in a spot where normally maybe they should be betting more, that generally speaks for a weaker hand in my opinion. People are more thoughtful with stronger hands when it's about bet sizing or chips they're using. Also one thing is when they bet 6,600 and they could be using bigger chips and they bet it with smaller chips, it's also been a rather reliable tell for people to have weaker hands when they use the more loosely put together chips or the smaller denominations. Because it looks stronger when more chips are bad or what. Not sure if this is actually true, but it could be. I mean, I don't play live at all or almost not at all. So but this seems a very easy thing to do and to recognize. Could be true. I, I, I'm not sure. So there are quite some things within bet sizing and how people choose bet sizings that can give you quite some information, especially when people are less experienced. I would say generally for these type of tells, the more experienced people are, um, the less they, I value them. But that's just a side note. So regarding bet sizings and bets in general, the main thing that I would say here that has me made hundreds of thousands of dollars is looking at the exact bets people are putting out in percentage of the pot. Because online people have buttons and they can click exactly 33% and 66%. But you will see there are these subconscious drivers in players to choose one over the other size. So if someone is betting 60% on the turn in a spot where normally he maybe has chosen 70 or 75 or 80% with value, these can be really, really strong tells as to the strength of the hand. Subconsciously, a lot of players, even pros, deviate a little bit in the size of the bet they choose depending on the hand strength they have. When they really want to try to extract value, it will most likely be these two, three nudges above it. And when they have a more speculative hand, it, it's not often that way. So for like the top pros, this does So that's probably true. Yeah, that's why you should use the same size always and don't deviate that much because then fellow holds will put up, uh, will pick something up. 
And yeah, I think this probably is true. And yeah, that's why I just have a constant bed sizing. Also, this thing also works for, for online and probably is also true for online. Doesn't count, but like for a really large part of players on the lower end, this counts a lot, especially with river beds. I have people who bet 50% pot or 60% pot on the river. This normally speaks for a pretty capped range with more weaker hands mixed in there. Whereas like they're la rather large, but it's like 75, 80, 90% pot generally are on the stronger end of their range. And when they bet that with their strong hands and you have seen that repetitively, then also that makes their smaller bets even weaker. So raising against those or, or um, hero calling against those in some spots has been proven to be a very, very successful strategy. So that... I thought that he would give us a lot of body related tells. These are all things you could use online too much to bets. I think there's a lot of value hidden in there, but let's go to the third and biggest category, the body tells. Now I tried to Finally. break it down to the things I gained the most from. There's probably hundreds of things you can be looking at. And for me, it's pulse, eyes, and posture. Mouth plays a role in people's hands. Pulse is a... <laughs> and uh, there's lots of other things that I'd be looking at, but I would say these three things are the ones I look at the most and that made me the most money in the long run. Let's start with pulse, which is by far the most important. I think over the years I got pretty good at being able to see someone's standard pulse and then the deviation in the pulse. So that was something I just trained, is just looking at pulses over and over again. I've probably seen thousands of different pulses and their normal pulse and how it increases and how it decreases over time. And the number one thing that I did, especially in river bets, is I kind of have an idea of the base pulse of someone. And then they're in an exciting situation, their pulse rises. So let's say they put in a large bet all in on the river in a big spot, they're excited. Their pulse goes up. What happens over time? Does it stay up? Do they get more relaxed? There's more information that flow in there. But this is the key aspect. If someone is excited, like let's say you have a boat, you have the nuts, you go all in on the river, you're really excited because it's a big pot, it's for your tournament life, and then it sinks in after 30 seconds is you can't lose. You know it already, but in that moment it's still exciting and it's for a lot of money and you put all the money in, but then there is something mentally sinking in that relaxes you a little bit and your pulse goes down a little bit. After 30 to 45 seconds, Generally, you can see that when someone has a really strong hand, there is a slight reduction in the pulse over time. And they are still... This looks sounds like very good advice, but you will have to make slow decisions and tank a lot in order to find that out. And it is bad for if people have... dresses like this, where you can't see what is happening with the, with the pulse. So... Against Fedor, we sh you should get something like that. Or do this. In a level of excitement because they can win a lot. But there's less stress around being called. There's less stress around busting because they know they can bust, especially when I take time. They know I don't have a really strong hand. So that is something that is very important to identify there. And now on the other hand, let's say he has king high and he shoves the river as a pure bluff and he's in the same spot. His pulse is really high, he's really excited because it's really scary. He might go out, uh, it's for a lot of money. And now I look at him and I'm thinking and like it's very visible that I'm maybe not folding and then he gets even more scared or excited and it's just keeping on that level. and. There you can see the difference where there's no level of that relaxation because you don't know. He might call, he might put in the chips, maybe I get even closer to putting in the chips and then you get more excited. So there is a difference between the nuts and a bluff and it's subtle because it's not that you're totally relaxed when you have the nuts, you're still excited but you're less afraid from busting. And that is the thing I really try to hone to really get very good at is seeing the difference between someone being scared, excited on a level where he might bust over a longer period of time versus him being excited about winning a big pot with the nuts or a strong hand. I like this tell. This seems a good one. And that, I think, is the number one tell that made me hundreds of thousands of dollars where I was able to bluff catch people in pretty absurd spot with hands that I would never call online, for example. So looking out for this disparity
between the pulse of a person when they're afraid to bust versus excited to win a big pot. That is my number one tell in terms of pulse. Now I mentioned I. Not sure how smart it is, but he tells it here because people watching these videos, I mean, not many, but still more than on my channel. His eyes are really, really big in life tests as well because there is blinking involved. It's where you look. It's giving so much context. So eyes are sometimes important by themselves, but also really important in the context of different things. With eyes, it's the hardest for me to, to give a specific tell as to what I, what I take from there or how it's valuable. It's really more how people have their eye style or like how they use their eyes or where they look. And there are some patterns that I learned over the years where there are certain patterns that more speak for strength to me and some that speak for weakness. So really try to observe the personal pattern of a player of where they go with their eyes. Generally, what you can see is there is a difference. And now this is really hard for me to just explain between someone actually locking their eyes and being in defense mode because that's just their reaction and someone consciously choosing to lock their eyes somewhere. My experience is if they're consciously choosing to lock their eyes somewhere, it's generally a strong hand because they are aware of they should do that to keep a posture, but they actually rather relax or kind of know what they're doing. So against me, this would be dangerous, this tell, because I usually, if someone is going into the tank, no matter if I have a good or a bad hand, I try to remain silent, don't move and look like on a, on a certain spot on the table or something. And yeah, I do it with bad and good hands. Whereas the first part is mostly a bluff where they're actually really uncomfortable. And there is something in the way people look and the way um, they have their head tilted and the way they look that, that gives that away. If you keep out looking for that, you will see more and more of that pattern where people have a more relaxed eye vision that is held somewhere versus like a more scared animalistic type of, um, well, okay, I really like need to stop. So he sees differences even when I'm staring at the table and can deduct my hand from that. Okay, that's scary. Up and do nothing right now. That's a pretty strong tell regarding eyes. Another is regarding blinking. I would also generally say that some players, few players have it that they blink a lot when they're, when they're weak, but generally I would say when people start to blink less, I see that more as a sign of weakness as well. Um, and when they have a more relaxed blinking, that's more a sign of relaxation and strength. Um, but that is something very individual. As I said in the beginning, you can't just say, oh, this, is, this counts for everyone. It's just that I've seen that um, there are different styles and different types for people. Oh, I think it's very hard to get a tell from someone's blinking, but maybe. And especially when I play more often with someone, this has really, really helped me in the past. One shout out, a very specific tell I can actually mention. Joe is always staring at people in these sort of situations and I think his eyes probably dry out because he's like staring so much and trying not to blink. But I think he does it with bluffs and value. The question here is, and this kind of ties in with number three posture, how people look, their eyes, as I always want to give some, some background and information is a really, really strong tell I have is on people seeing when they think. So this one goes to Ike Axon. He always timed things. He always tried to keep in the same time of things. And so he had this look that he put on around the time. So let's say he always takes 10 to 15 seconds. He shuffles, he randomizes, and then he does something. And there are spots where I can see in his face if he's actually thinking or not thinking, or at least I believe so. So there is a difference between a brain working and, and how a face looks when a brain is working and a brain that already knows what it's doing and is I think that's also a um, big tell and it's probably true. Um, I think there is some sub subconscious or hard to uh, suppress eye movement. So if you think something, you might look I don't know, upper, upper left or something. I don't know where exactly, but there, uh, you you can probably, uh, if you are very um, observative, see if someone is actually thinking or is, if someone already made up his mind. Waiting. It's just two different postures. It's two different types of faces. You can see in my face if I'm thinking or if I'm waiting. 
And that differentiation helped me a lot because if I know he knows what he will do, that rules out some hands. Because there are certain spots where you know you need to think. You know, I know it will be somewhat of a new spot for him or it's a difficult decision. And if I know he has an easy decision, then I can rule out some hands. And that actually has been a pretty reliable tell, I believe, in, in countless situations with a couple of players who have a similar style. So making this... Uh so this is more a read on the pros who try to have the same sizing all the time. And yeah, not sizing, timing. But how they look while they time down the 10 seconds or something, or 15 seconds, how long they, for how long ever they wait, can see in their pace and posture if they actually think or if they already made up their mind. I think that's very smart. This is very good one. Thanks for that, Fedor. Uh, very specific as to why eyes and, and posture matter even on the highest level. The slouching, I would say, is, is generally also something rather weak. Also, if people are more relaxed, more relaxed in their shoulders, generally more type of strength. Number one thing, if people drink while they play a hand, I think uh, 18 out of 18, I have seen it, they always have it. So whatever you talk yourself into, don't call them when they take a zip of their drink. Might also be one of the best reverse tells in history to try to drink something when you play a hand. And um, these are the key aspects of what I see within live poker. Um, some of my secrets around live tells and what I have been looking for and what made me a lot of money playing live poker. I hope this was helpful for you. I hope you enjoyed my secrets to live poker. If you liked it, leave a subscribe. We will keep you informed around all the videos that are coming up. I wish you a wonderful week. Video, I like it. Um, I mean, it was relatively long for the little bit of information, but yeah, it it was a pleasure to watch and I had fun. I also learned some things. So this was a good one. And yeah, now I also want to add some, um, some online tells. I mean, he also touched on that already with bed sizing and stuff, but yeah, online you generally have two types of of situations uh, and, and and tells one is the timing tell the other one is a bad sizing tell and yeah yeah he already talked a lot about bad sizings but yeah especially if you analyze players regulars against whom you play a lot you will find something for most players so for example like a 60% bad is more often weak when not and yeah something like that and especially the later the street the less people care about being balanced or i don't know if it care less but it, it happens more often that it gets unbalanced and yeah bed sizing is one big thing so people might always be laughing with smaller sizes for example I also saw the opposite, where people were laughing way too often with bigger sizings because we want to scare people off. So that's also a bit um, person dependent. But yeah, bad sizings definitely is a huge thing. And yeah, I. But for to get a read, you need to play with the guy a lot, and you need to pay attention or to analyze it before the game or in Hold'em Manager, for example. And the other things are timings. This is also not the same for every player. So um, you should pay attention and maybe make notes. So he took that amount of time and he was weak. And the next time he again took this, this timing and he was weak again. And yeah, so you can um, maybe get a good idea of what timing means, means which. Uh, or I think then people do something instantaneous. Then it's often a tell because it rules out some portion of his range because he either made up his mind before that he would bluff on certain cards and something and then did it instantaneous or he had a very easy value bet and Therefore, was betting instantaneous. But if this is a difficult situation, he usually would have to think a bit about it if it's close, what he should do. And if he does something instantaneous, then it's 
not a closed board, so you can rule out some portions of his range. It's like the tell which Fedor had when he looked into the face of Ike Hexen and he can see if he's thinking or not. And yeah, so if people do something very quickly, it might be a tell. And also, I think some people, there are some guys that play very, very fast in general. And if they take very long for a decision, you can often learn something about that. I mean, it's often then a very close spot. For example, if someone is calculating in his head or if he can, can still um, continue with his draw, getting these odds. And I think people also like to mix in very strong hands where they pretend that they have a difficult decision, but actually have the nuts. But yeah, it's, yeah, that's another thing. And yeah, it's also often player dependent, as for everything. What means strength for one guy might be weakness for another. And yeah, in general, I think this is, these are, these reads are often like, you have to be very observative in life and also online. And then you will pick up a lot of little things, which this will help you a ton to, to have a better win rate. And it will make a difference between an average wreck and a wreck who destroys. And yeah, also something very important that you have to keep in mind. If someone plays very many tables... You probably also can learn way more from his timing. I mean, sometimes you might make a wrong read because he might just have taken so long on your table because he had a difficult decision on the other one. But in general, if he acts very quickly, you could, from a massive multi tabler, you can always assume that this was a standard decision for him. So he had nothing to think about. So that's already helping you out. And yeah, I guess that was it. I'm not sure if I added that much. It felt a bit like I was just talking, but don't get that much value in here. But yeah, as, as I said, um, timing tells and also um, underrated thing, you often learn things about people if they start to chat, even regulars, then they um, go after you and are very mean to you and, and use swear words, especially, this is especially true for um, non regs then you can really, you can assume that, that they are probably on tilt and might play a bit different than they normally do. And yeah, man, this is even true for some regulars of the worst ones. So yeah, also chat can, can be can be some can give some information away. Yeah, I hope this was helpful. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. Um, yeah, please please follow on Twitch if you're watching on Twitch. And please remember, if you watch this on YouTube, like, subscribe, share, obviously. And yeah, also the bell notification to get notified once a new video is out. And yeah, consider also to follow me on my other channels, like the Twitter. Does not have many followers, but I will always um, let you know when I will go live. And if you want to watch me live, yeah, you can all, only do this on Twitch. And yeah, there's also an additional benefit. You can chat with me. I will answer your questions. This is not that easy if you just watch a YouTube video. So yeah, keep all this in mind. And yeah. Good luck at the tables. I hope you learned something. I learned a lot. It was a very great video by Fedor. Yeah, until next time. Bye-bye.